Okay, um, today I'm interviewing Quinn, uh, Quinn Morley. He uh, graduated from our program, uh, WCU Mechanical Engineering. And um, so I had the privilege of uh, teaching him uh, four different courses. But uh, while he was a WCU student, mechanical engineering student, he actually got about $300,000 from NASA to, to work on uh, his projects. He's an inventor. So, uh, Quinn, just uh, go ahead, tell me a little bit about yourself, because uh, this is pretty exciting. Yes, yeah, so I grew up out here. I grew up on the Key Peninsula, about a half hour from Gig Harbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm actually a high school dropout. I dropped out in 2001, uh, a year early, got a GED. And I did a bunch of random jobs uh, for the few years after that. I always kind of had a rebellious attitude, so it was always friction in the workplace. I remember one of my my first uh, real jobs was uh, working in a race car shop, kind of sweeping the floor. And, and that uh, was yeah. how many years ago? Uh, this would have been about 2006, 2007, maybe. Okay. So that's, you were pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. I always had this sort of uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And I remember specifically at that job, when my first days on the job, I told the boss, his name was Bucky. I said, uh, hey, you should have these ladies in the office set up direct deposit for you. It'd be a lot less trouble getting everyone on board and doing payroll, you know? And he goes, listen, kid, when you work for me, you get a paycheck and you take it to the bank. You got any questions? That's said, it. No, no That's questions, it. I guess. Whatever, you know? so, so how long did that job last for you? I'm, I'm guessing that, you know. That was mainly one summer. It's about four okay. months or so. And I got out of there. And uh, the next year I ended up getting on a Boeing, which was kind of a, a long process to get hired at Boeing at the time. So mm -hmm. uh, the way that worked was I went to an unpaid training program in Everett. So I had to go live with my uncle in Seattle, drive to Everett every day without getting paid for a month. And that kind of qualifies you. Yeah, that's me when I was at my first job at Boeing. We're going on a tour of the Everett plant. So it qualifies you when you finish that training for a whole family of assembly mechanic jobs. And then they do a lottery as they need mechanics and pull you out of that qualified applicant pool. And so I got pulled into actually a pretty gravy location in Auburn. They call it the Auburn Retirement Center. It was a duck shop. And that's, uh, I built, a, I'm pointing up here to one of these big seven inch ventilation ducts. Yeah. For the 747. Okay. You, want, you were a duct assembler, but eventually you worked on different parts of an airplane. Is that correct? Yeah. So later I got into something called the Blue Streak Mechanic Apprenticeship. It's an IAM union apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a really cool experience. So I moved across the street in Auburn. And I was in that for four years and I graduated that in uh, 2017. And that the idea with that job was what we did as a trade was we made any part for any airplane, which is a drawing. So there could be no tooling or support or the production system wasn't able to make the part anymore or make it yet. And so we just had to figure it out. So that was a really good place for me, a creative work wow. there. Yeah. And then, so, so you were working for, you were a high school dropout. You ended up working for Boeing as a mechanic. And then uh, something happens. Of course, I, I can see that's uh, that's your wife that uh, the, in the picture, and uh, very lovely. And then eventually, you decided to to leave Boeing, and uh, and then you started the WCU program as a mechanical engineer. How did how did that work out? Yeah, that all happened. A bunch of things happened sort of in quick succession. So uh, shortly after the Max disasters, you know, the company started bleeding money, and then COVID hit, which was a nightmare for Boeing because now here they're their number one cash crop, the 737, they're not making it anymore. Yes. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hits and they can't sell their other planes. Uh, the whole market tanked for aviation. So they started laying people off. And, and uh, I remember I was sitting there looking at getting into this engineering program and I was looking at a severance package and government uh, federally funded unemployment. If I took this voluntary layoff and so that's what I did. I took a voluntary layoff in June of 2020 and uh, in preparation for going to engineering. And also I had something in mind. I've been thinking for a while about uh, submitting a NASA technology grant application. And so I did that after I, I kind of got out of Boeing. Later that month, I submitted my first proposal, which was a, a three page proposal to a program called NIAC at NASA. And they look at, at far reaching concepts like 10 to 40 years in the future. 
So, so NIAC is, uh, from what I know, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. And uh, yes. could, you, could you talk about that a little bit? What do they do? Yeah, so NIAC is, is basically a, a really forward-looking program that they want new technologies that can enable a wholly new class of missions. Uh -huh. so they like to see that new innovative technology in a mission context, and they're thinking next decade missions at the earliest. So it has to be really high risk kind of a technology investment. And that's sort of how NASA gets that high risk, high reward innovation is through uh -huh. this program. They have some other programs now as well, uh, but this is the riskiest. Yes. And it's actually the riskiest in NASA's pipeline and one of the riskiest programs in the entire federal grant pipeline. Yes, as opposed to other, you know, uh, programs that they have. You know, the, yeah. the, like small business innovative research is is more of a traditional. Uh, it still has a lot of risk in the innovation. You know, if you're not going to get high quality innovation unless you're taking risks. Yeah, absolutely. And SBIR does take risks. That's the small business innovative research. But NIAC is uh, even more cutting edge than that. So it was really attractive to me. I like that cutting edge part of it. And this is the grant that was one hundred twenty five thousand dollars, right? And yeah. uh, we're going to talk about that later. But um, you, you told me something that, uh, you know, you, you had this idea. And so you were coming from, uh, where do you live right now? Do you live in Auburn or Tacoma or uh, where, where, where are you now right now? Big Harbor. Big Big Harbor. Harbor. Okay, Harbor. And then you were driving to school, coming back and forth. We had this conversation before. That's some Yeah, so I was driving to Bremerton yeah. uh, five days a week for school in the morning. And then in the afternoon, a lot of times I couldn't even come home for lunch. I have to drive right by my house and go all the way to work in Auburn. And so I was driving about 500 miles a week. And, and then you were listening to some sort of podcast or something. And a lot of podcasts, a lot of audiobooks. Exciting. But specifically, this podcast uh, was particularly inspiring. Uh, is after they announced the finding of uh, potential liquid water underneath the South Polar ice cap of Mars. Yes. They had these, these two NASA scientists, Jim Garvin and Chris McKay, on there sort of debating and collaborating uh this data set that came in and how we could prove it or disprove it what the next steps would be and the general consensus was we need to drill a hole all the way down through the ice sheet to get to the water and so it's about a mile down kilometer and a half down and now you're talking about drilling and so drilling. what what you innovated i mean your innovation was um because because i remember you know we had well, we remember getting this that one of our students actually you know, got some money from NASA for this project, but what what separated your innovation from regular drilling? So this this slide shows uh, more regular drilling. Uh, it's called a wireline drill or a cable suspended electromechanical drill. And the idea here is they have the the data, the power, everything, and the steel cable to support the the load of the drill all going up through a tether to a large winch and you can see on the right picture they've got this this huge winch these towers are three meters tall yeah and so the whole thing relies on these cable systems and to me trying to build an automated system for another planet that seemed to be really complicated having to deal with routing this cable what if you have to bring a spare cable if there's a problem uh you know if you on if a different winch, planet yeah yeah on a different planet you can't go out there and fix the winch or oil it you know, yes. and so for me, it seemed like a, like quite a problem. And also this slide, interestingly, it shows in the, the left picture, the top right of it, they have these grippers they deploy against the wall, of the borehole, and that's to oppose rotational force. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, why don't they just put tank tracks there instead yeah. of grippers and just drive and get rid of the cable? So it, it looks like nobody had ever thought about this, that uh, what about a cable-less option? Yeah. Yeah. And then this I mean, your iPhone's wireless, right? Yeah, and this is what you came up with, basically. Yeah. So that's that's the to drill it without any cable. So it just yeah. drops in, collects the sample, and comes back up. So right? we call it a, uh, it's a self-driving drilling robot, and we call it a bore bot. Mm, it has a track awesome. system integrated into it, and I've got uh, got a little one of my old prototypes from 2020 here. So you have these rubber tank tracks that push against the borehole. And there's actually some squish here. It acts as a preload. Uh huh. And that gives you that, that uh, counter rotating force when the drill bit's rotating, but also allows you to drive up and down the hole. Yes. Okay. So this is pretty, pretty interesting. So, and this is, I guess you had a, a close up look of it here. Yeah. So that, that's what you're talking about. 
Yep. This is the one that uh, you got 125K uh, for it. And I remember uh, you worked with another student of ours, uh, yep. Tom Bowen. Tom Bowen. Tom Bowen. Yeah. yeah. So he also graduated from the program. He graduated in 2021, class of 20. Yeah. So Tom was my partner in electric circuits. Most people know him. He went on to TA for electric circuits. I was convinced I wouldn't have passed electric circuits without Tom as my partner. And so when I was starting to work on this proposal, you know, the way it works is you submit a three page proposal and they invite you to submit a eight page proposal for NIAC. And so when I got that invitation. I needed, you know, I needed staff now. I needed to figure out how to do a budget and all this stuff. And so I, I called Tom and was like, Hey, can you help me with this? What if there's electronic stuff? I'll be lost. I need your help. And so he agreed to help me with that. Had you written proposals before to get any any grants? Because I well, as a professor, I know you know a lot of professors write grants, and these things could be nightmares just to just to very competitive. I mean, just to get money, and you got one. Well, NIAC is definitely competitive. I don't think the proposals are a nightmare. Uh, they're yeah. challenging. I think that in a lot of ways they're simpler than most other proposals. I did have experience in high school uh, before I dropped out. I did submit an SBIR proposal to the Navy for a underwater, you know, torpedo water breathing propulsion system. It was basically a jet engine that would bring in seawater and vaporize it and tear it apart and burn it. And this okay. was at the time they were looking, they heard the Russians were building supersonic torpedoes and they were trying to figure out ways for us to do that too. It was kind of a fad in the 2000s was these high speed torpedoes. Now, of course, it's all acoustics and stealth. Right, but at the time it was, what if we just go faster than the sound? This is and something so really interesting. This is very interesting that we haven't talked about. Now I'm yeah. just thinking about that this could be another interview because that that's the kind of stuff that I really love, like the fluids. Yeah. And um, so I remember you had um, another picture of uh, this invention. And then is this 3D printed? Yep, those are all 3D printed. Uh, I could 3D print rubber parts that have mechanical component this one here had a belt drive that was the idea to move the whole thing with one one motor and one belt and then it would hook through the rest of the system and power both the belts through that one gear so did you end up um you know um making you making it for nasa and then uh how did the project and are you still working on it so so what's the deal we're kind of in a transitional period right now so we did uh do a lot of work on that one of the things that we that tom and i did was tom helped Tom did most of the work on, on this part of it. He built a model from first principles just to show the energy budget of drilling down through an ice sheet with any robot that has to go up and down. Because even if you use the cable, there's an energy requirement for running the winch all day long, opposing gravitational energy and any frictional losses. And so we figured out the energy budget for that and how many trips it would take for a team of robots to do that. It looks like about 10,000 trips total for the system to get down uh, a mile deep. And we did some uh, outlining of how to build it. I built some prototypes. Uh, I don't have a complete integrated prototype like to bring to a trade show or something yet. That's one of the things I need to work on hopefully this fall. And what I mean by transitional is we're trying to get our phase two funding going forward, hopefully in 2024. Mm -hmm. NIAC has a larger grant for phase two work to sort of bring that technology development farther along so it's ready for a potential mission customer or an SBIR to commercialize it later. Okay, so you're working on another grant just to to fund the project and keep going from here. Okay, yep. that's very interesting. And then, um, so um, then uh, you were also part part of the WSU program too. And uh, then eventually, the, uh, you worked on this project. And uh, the, then then what happened after you worked on it and you got the money? And uh, so what's next? Yeah. So NIAC grants, uh, the phase one NIAC grants are nine months long. And uh -huh. so after that first school year ended, uh, you know, it was, it was May, I was out, I was set loose with no job. My grant had finished. Um, and so I just got on this old mountain bike and rode across the Cascade Mountains. I went from Greenwater to Ellensburg and back over the course of five days or so. And I had a good summer that year. I, I did a lot of bike rides. I did three bike rides in the woods like this, this sort of scale. I did a lot of bike rides around town. Uh huh. It's a lot of fun. And then uh, you got some pictures of Mount Rainier, one of my favorite volcanoes. So that's good. Yeah. Um. 
so then uh, uh the let's talk about the the new grant that you got 175k and uh, i remember that you also came to uh our hiking you know uh part of the sme club that we have in bremerton washington yeah. that uh, you you joined the hiking trips and then eventually you graduated but at the same time i remember before you graduated you got that 175k from nasa for a different project yep. and uh, what is this new project all about so the the key technology for the new project uh if you imagine looking out the window of an airplane as you go through a cloud you'll see water flowing along the window or along the wing and the idea was what if we could drink that water in through the wing skin like maybe a permeable section of the wing skin and look at the water for scientific reasons and what if we did that on another planet Yes, because the so rain, if, if, the other planet is Titan. Saturn. Yeah, it could be Titan. It could be Venus. It could be some other planet, some other solar system. But if you if you had an airplane in a planetary atmosphere and you wanted to look at the science of what the precipitation contains within it, how would you do that? That was the yeah. The crux so that's of the that. idea. So that yeah. was the idea, and I remember um, last semester when you were a student. I guess you took a week off and you went to Washington D.C. and you gave this talk because you had won the grant one hundred seventy five k uh before this picture and yep. what was this talk all about then we can talk about the actual project what you did yeah. so I, I did uh one panel discussion and one talk when i was there this is from the panel discussion and basically on day two we showed up and and the keynote speaker had canceled and so there were four NIAC fellows that this was their second phase one grant in the room and they threw all of us up on a table to answer a bunch of questions and we have these two guys on the left uh lou friedman and david brin they're on the NIAC External Advisory Council. They sort of counsel NASA on how to keep the program looking high risk. It, it's in the government, uh, you or especially NASA, over time, things get less risky. And so they bring in these, these guys with a science fiction background to keep pushing them forward and make sure you've got to do higher risk uh, grants. And yeah. so they put all of us, all six of us up here uh, to ask us questions. Uh, as the keynote. And then later that day after lunch, I gave a talk about specifically about my grant. Okay. So now let's talk about the interesting stuff. And that is uh, your innovative idea about how to collect um, fluids, basically, uh, using a vehicle like this, which is just a conceptual picture at this point. But uh, so, so the idea was, from what I understand it, is that, for example, in the, um, Saturn's Titan, um, the atmosphere has methane, and there is uh, methane rains, there is methane rivers, you know, and then yeah. it's in the atmosphere. So you want to collect the same way that we have water in our atmosphere, yeah. right? And then you invented, I mean, conceptually, something like this that um, can collect that water while it flies through the atmosphere. So like an atmospheric probe, if you will. I don't yeah. know if that's the right word. Right. Star Trek probe. Yeah, there you go. So now the, uh, I would love to uh, hear more about this. Do we have the Titan slide with Saturn on the next slide? Yeah, that's, uh, I guess. Okay, the, yeah, there we go. That's the guy. So uh, Titan is Saturn's largest moon. We see it there in the foreground. It's bigger than our moon. It's bigger than the planet Mercury. Yeah, it's, it looks pretty big. It's, it's huge. So it's got uh, a thick nitrogen atmosphere and it has more pressure at the surface than we have on earth yeah. uh, now the, the big difference you want to remember when we're drawing analogies between the two uh, planets titan and earth is that although they're both nitrogen atmospheres the temperature is so much different that methane takes the place of water in the hydrological cycle and we still don't completely understand this hydrological cycle but it does appear there's there's clouds that are composed of methane and you get methane rain, and there's large methane lakes, especially in the North Polar region. Okay. And then, so why does it matter that we want to actually analyze the methane in the atmosphere there? So what, what's the deal? I mean, what's the outcome? Well, to, to get into that, to provide a little bit of backstory. So uh, in the 50s, this guy, Stanley Miller, started to do research about ancient Earth atmospheres. And what he did was he put... Uh, what they thought would be primordial earth atmosphere like we don't know exactly what it was right but they had several ideas of what our atmosphere could be early on like before the dinosaurs right before life existed here and so he put this primordial atmosphere in this glass vessel and then basically hit it with lightning 
And what he found was complex organic material formed in these reactions induced by the lightning, including amino acids. And so you had this whole soup of prebiotic chemistry that happened just from a lightning strike. Okay. And, and so that... then, yeah, to take that a step further, Carl Sagan showed that in Titan's atmosphere, he, he had a whole team of people working on this, uh, but it was all Carl Sagan's team at Cornell. They showed that in the upper atmosphere of Titan, UV radiation from the sun actually initiates similar reactions to what Stanley Miller had shown. And so you get this prebiotic chemistry created by UV radiation in the upper atmosphere of Titan, and then it filters down over hundreds or thousands of years to the surface. And so the surface is covered with this sludgy organic material that contains amino acids, we think. So that might, so what you're saying is there might be life there. Well, that's, that's what later on, uh, Chris McKay, who's a, a NASA astrobiologist at Ames Research Center, he hypothesized that if this prebiotic chemistry ever became alive, it could potentially um, metabolize acetylene and cyanide with the methane that's available and live off of that on its journey down through the atmosphere. And that if that was the case, you would find a depletion of hydrogen on the surface. So we, we know from the synthesis and the methane that exists in the atmosphere and the chemical reactions we expect, what hydrogen content we would see on the surface. And he was saying, if there's life going on, you're going to see less hydrogen, less free hydrogen at the surface. And then later on, we sent a probe there and that's what it found. And that, that's what by uh, Cassini aircraft. Yeah, the Cassini spacecraft deployed the Huygens probe yeah, yeah. as it did its flyby of Titan and it slammed into the atmosphere and then deployed a parachute and went all the way down to the surface with the cameras running and the instruments going and uh, developed a profile of the composition of the atmosphere uh, very with depth. And it found that there, there was a missing hydrogen near the surface, just like Chris had hypothesized. And so this is a very much an open question. I'm not saying, oh, there's life on Titan. Now, I do think if the reporters put this together, they would have said there's life on Titan, but they're too busy about water on Mars. They didn't think about it at the time or whatever. Um, yeah. but, but Chris, I'm sure would say it's an open question. There, there could be non-biological processes that happen that we don't understand. And so it yeah. may not be life at all. But this, this does match his prediction for uh, life that metabolized organics. So from what, what I understand, if we can sample um, the atmosphere on Titan, and then we look at hydrogen depletion, we can probably guess if there is life there or not. That's that's what yeah, you That's what the probe did. And then you, you, you said something else. You talked about uh, what, what Chris McKay said, that uh, you mentioned acetylene and uh so and methane these two things and uh we do have acetylene on titan right mm -hmm. okay so um yeah, there's uh, lots of uh, compounds that are composed of acetylene they call them polyacetylides or something and also compounds built off cyanide all these organics uh, that we see on earth form there as well and then they become larger complicated things because there's no oxygen there to react with them yeah, so okay. on Earth, this material that forms in the atmosphere will quickly be oxidized. But since there's low oxygen on Titan, it can survive and grow and form these strange compounds that we don't see that often on Earth. Yeah. And then, then uh, from, you know, Cassini spacecraft actually went over there and sent the probe. And then this is just the artist conception of the Huygens probe. Yeah. yeah. What they did. Now, so um, uh, here's something that is interesting that um when we get these these ideas normally you have seen something like this before that you can connect the dots and you're like okay well um it, we we have the similar example on our earth and then it could be something like that on a different planet so and could could you talk about that when you actually study like the these methane drops um, yeah, so on, I, on Earth, if you looked at a raindrop or a drop of water out of the ocean, uh, there could be viruses, bacteria, mold spores, all kinds, maybe even millions of virus particles inside each drop. And mm -hmm. so the idea is if we go fly through a cloud on Titan, get that condensation on the wing and bring it in and analyze it, what are we going to find? Are we going to find organic material in the raindrop? Is it possibly going to contain life, just amino acids? You know, we don't know. It's, it's kind of amazing to think about. 
So uh, as I understand, as I understand it, NASA already has a program to send another probe to Titan, and uh, which is this one. So the, this is the have, Dragonfly mission. How, how have they thought about this, or is this going to be capable of what you are uh, you you want to accomplish, or so what's the deal? So in reality, there's not a lot of overlap with what Dragonfly is going to do. The the overriding idea with Dragonfly is that Titan was just having a, uh, the community was trying to get missions to Titan because it's an exciting place, yeah. and they couldn't get any missions selected. And the reason why is they were all really too risky. There's a lot of balloon concepts and just crazy, crazy ideas. And so this team at APL put their thinking caps on and decided to go with what they call a relocatable lander. And it, it reduced the mission risk. Mm -hmm. And it allows them to, um, I guess someone knock on the door. Okay. UPS is here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, so Dragonfly is a low mission risk scenario that's how they won their grant that's how they won the funding for this is by reducing risk and the way they reduce risk is they went to the desert or during a dry period and they're doing it with a, a rotor craft so if they land in a boring place or a risky place they can take off and move to where a rover might get stuck in a boring area okay and so they, they can move this thing around every month if they want to to go to new and exciting areas but they're still they're stuck with this desert profile in a dry season. And so what we want to do is go the opposite of that. We want to go high risk and high reward and target those wetter areas of Titan, mainly the north polar regions where the lakes are during a wet time of the season. Uh, we can expect to have those methane clouds and rain. So here's one, one quick question. So uh, I, I kind of understand what you're talking about. So what the Titan Air project is going to accomplish is going to do things that normally dragonfly can't do is that is that what you're saying correct so, yeah, so, so uh, those... an independent review by the national academies of sciences engineering and medicine found that after dragonfly there's going to be several major open science questions for titan mm -hmm. so they recommended titan you know they're very emphatic with titan is a great mission we should move forward on that but also they emphasized after titan's done we're going to have this whole series of questions that we don't have answers to yet so what are those questions that, that we are looking at right now? One of them is cloud formation. We don't know how the clouds form. If they form like on Earth with uh, seed nuclei and they grow from there. We don't know if they're ice or liquid. Uh, we do think they're liquid, but uh, there's a lot of assumptions baked in like that. And so what we really want to do is investigate those organics from the atmosphere and their native precipitation. We want to look at this whole methane cycle that mimics the hydrological cycle on Earth including looking at the habitability of the lakes. And so, and, yeah. and the, 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 that's, that's what you were talking about. Yeah. So the composition of the lakes and we expect the organic material would sink rapidly through the lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the methane cycle, which mimics our hydrological cycle here. And then the next thing is sort of a stretch goal. Uh, since we think the material, any organic material that lands in the lakes would sink immediately. And also it's not going to be very soluble in the methane. What this tells us is that that area where the liquid and the solid are existing near the beach could be a hot spot for life. Mm -hmm. And that could help us understand what happens at the bottom of the lake as well, where we it's harder to get to. But if we look at the beach, it can sort of represent that liquid solid interface. And also the interesting thing about going to shorelines on Titan is it's really risky for something like Dragonfly because it could land and never be able to take off again. Yeah, when we don't know what the mud's going to be like because it's lower gravity. It could be like uh, a lake bottom on Earth where it's really fluffy material that you could get stuck in the muck. So it'd be too risky to send a rover or a rotor craft to the beach uh, straight from space and land on the beach. That might be the last thing you do. You yeah. might get stuck. And so since we're on the water, we, we designed our mission to be a flying boat that could land on the lake and take off from the lake and do that maybe every day, maybe every week and fly around for an hour or two, we could get close to the beach with the flying boat and stay on the water and kind of loiter around and investigate the shoreline. We might talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. That's that's very interesting, which is uh, pretty much like our shorelines. I mean, on Earth, that if you drive your car there, you might get stuck yeah. uh, on the beach. And also, there is a lot of life on the shoreline. 
So yeah, there's always a lot. Of, that's why the the low tide has that distinctive smell. It's a very biologically productive area. Yeah. Okay. This is this is exciting. So now about your invention. So that was like a good background, and about what you did. Of course, uh, you guys didn't do something like this. It's just a conceptual picture. But so what did you do uh, here? So that's that's the interesting thing that uh, yeah, we've got to forget about the concept art if we want to talk about yeah how the system works everybody gets hung up so we could think about something like this yeah or maybe even if we go to the next one we could think about something like this now this this guy gerardo operates a seaplane in the canary islands and he emailed me right after we won uh this grant and said hey you know what just let's use my seaplane let's do this right now and so he's excited to, to help test out a system like this and so if we think about gerardo's airplane which we could just you know a normal airplane on the planet earth how do we do that? How are we going to use uh, Gerardo's plane to look for this virus and raindrop? Mm -hmm. And so on uh, a terrestrial aircraft, there's always empty space and the leading edge of the wing. And it's because that's for aerodynamics, not necessarily for structural reasons. Yes. And a lot of times there's de-icing equipment in the front of that, but not so much in the general aviation aircraft like Gerardo's. Uh, commercial airliners will have some sort of system in the, in the wing for icing. Uh, there's always empty space in there, though. And so we were thinking, what if we install our system in the front of the wing? Now, how are we going to use the space in the front of the wing to do our science? Well, we're going to do it with cacti and sugar cubes. Now, the sugar cube on the right, we can see it sucking the coffee up with a process called imbibition. Mm -hmm. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about how the cacti work. Okay. So cacti get most of their water from the atmosphere. And the way they do that is uh, they pull the water out of the air and it condenses onto the spines and then the water drops slowly grow and they transport themselves down. The geometry of the spine helps the cactus pull the water towards its stem. And once it gets over to these trichomes, it gets sucked into the stem of the cactus. So what, what what cactus does is basically through evolution they learn how to collect water in an area in a desert where there's not a whole lot of water in the air so yeah. they just pull it right out of the air in the morning every morning and so on the inside of our airplane skin the inside of our wing uh, we want to do is use imbibition to bring that liquid through the holes and then collect it in these v grooves and through capillary action route it to this this rod, this cactus rod that mimics the cactus spine and transport it to a suction port and then route it inside the aircraft and do science with it. Mm -hmm. So now here's one question, because this, this is very exciting. And uh, so you got your ideas from nature. You got your ideas from when you were a mechanic at Boeing. Definitely that 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 helped you with, with these things. So what stage are you at in this project? So you got the money and you're working on it right now. And this is pretty exciting. So um, uh, are you doing calculations? Uh, have you built it? Where are you at right now? Yeah, so right now we're doing a lot of testing. We've been doing testing uh, mainly on my end for months. And then I've got a team uh, at WSU that we're working in conjunction with that's doing analysis. We're still trying to figure out how to model different aspects of this and sort of combine, because you can think about there's different stages in the cycle. How do you combine that so all the flow rates are equal uh, without it flooding or having uh, any sort of issues like that. And so we're still working on that. We're also uh, meeting weekly with uh, Stephen Collicott at Purdue. He's helping us. He's got decades of experience doing low gravity fluids research with capillary action. And so he's helping to steer us and sort of check our work. And there's been several times where we've come up with a, a, maybe a method for how something works and then he'll show us how it actually works like this. And so it's really good to have that experience. That that is really really exciting. Now, so um, um, if somebody wants to find more about your work, and uh, so I'm going to put the yep, information in go. the description. Now, of course, there is also this that the collaborators and the, the people, uh, you know, and your website, and then there is the TitanAir.fyi, so they can find that information. And yep. um, is there anything else you want to mention? What are the future projects? Because I remember you talked about uh, the fact that this could be some future projects for students also, and um, uh, you know, continuing this work. 
continuing. Yeah, this. one of the things that I need to learn how to do sort of as an entrepreneur is is outreach, like reach out to groups of students and involve them uh, in solving some of these technology problems. And maybe the shoreline sampling, for example, we talked about earlier, we could have teams of students work together to figure out uh, maybe we want to build a smaller vehicle to deploy from the larger flying boat to go examine the shoreline. And that way, if that smaller vehicle got stuck, it wouldn't really hurt the mission. We would just leave it there and move on. Yeah. But if we think about a robust way to build a small vehicle that could fly or float or drive off the wing and get to the beach and get a sample and bring it back to us without risking the larger boat, larger flying boat. So we're looking at ways to, to do outreach like that with like a student uh, capstone projects and stuff. Like a senior design project. Yeah. Deal. Yeah. And then, and for Borbots, that might work really well. I, I did get some feedback from NASA early on in Borbots that that would be a really good option for student outreach. Uh, we they even suggested that since Borbots could be, you know, potentially it could be on your desk, right? It could be a meter long, not not some huge thing. You could have students building them in competitions or, or something all across the country. Like right now, a lot of schools build CubeSats and students send them into space. You could use like the lunar uh, science we're doing. We're going to send a lot of spacecraft in anticipation of the Artemis mission. Uh, you could have student designed Borbots be tested on the moon. This is really exciting. And um, um, I, I am so proud of you. And uh, I didn't even know that you were working on these projects when uh, you were the students, because um, you were just like everybody else. Uh, I was were... just trying to keep my head down and, and do the yeah. work, yeah. Yeah, keep your head down and uh, move in zigzag pattern and just, uh, just um, so it's, uh, it was, it was very exciting when I heard the news and then the amount of money, you know, $300,000 that you got from NASA and then you were working on these exciting projects and what I like a lot about it is the fluid mechanics part of it. That is the, the cacti, the capillary action, you know, this whole thing. So uh, all I can say, I'm very proud of you. And uh, so we're going to put the, yeah, the link in the description, everything. And then uh, so I, I can see that you're going to be very successful. Also, we're both on LinkedIn. So people can reach out on LinkedIn is a good way. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to put it in the in the description. Well, thank you very much for your time. This was really fun. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.